Um, and so definitely read through that, read through it multiple times and take note. I think that that's something that is really critical is you can plagiarize the actual grant um, request for proposals. I talked to you guys about white space. I'm leaving some white space in between paragraphs. I'm also using some bold type and also underlining. Sunset slow, hey, you know you should stay for the night. What you think when we're drinking. Okay, so now I'm all ready to go. Um, if you're new, I'm Kristen and I'm a professor and I'm going to share with you all about academic life. In today's video, I'm going to be reflecting on why I'm here in Utah attending a grant writing training and I'm going to tell you everything I've learned about grant writing. All right, so I'm sitting here um, with my computer and also with feedback that I got after submitting a National Institute of Health grant. National Institute of Health is one of the most competitive uh, grant funders in the United States and because I research health, it is my ultimate goal. So even though I receive grants from other organizations, I definitely feel like it's my life goal to get a grant from them. Um, this is my second time submitting, but I submitted a brand new application this time. I submitted two years ago, right after having my first baby, and I didn't have that much preliminary data, which I'll talk about. And so I just came in with a new application with my preliminary data this time. So I'm sitting here at this little desk in um, the hotel room. I have my Starbucks, which is a day old, so I'm excited my breakfast should be coming here soon, and I'll have some new maybe coffee or tea. Um, but I mentioned getting this for myself yesterday for self-care, so um, if you missed that, go ahead and watch that video. So what I want to do is talk to you about everything I've learned about grant writing today. Um, and I'm going to learn more today, and I'm excited to reflect with you about that. So the first thing that I have learned is to be really good about reading the request for proposals. So when you are wanting to apply for a grant, sometimes there is a document that is 100 pages, and I'm not kidding, um, for National Institute of Health or other large foundations that might have grants. And they're very specific about what they're looking for. Um, and so definitely read through that, read through it multiple times and take notes about exactly what they're looking for. And first of all, assess whether or not the project that you can do really fits into the aims of things, the goals that for that entire organization. For my example today, it's National Institute of Health um, and for that specific request for proposals. So whether or not you see that it's a good fit, um, don't force it because if you do, you're not going to be successful. If you feel like you're forcing it, they will too. So the second thing is that there's usually some specific requirements for each section of the grant. There's also specific requirements about font size sometimes and font type. And these things can be frustrating, um, but this is just Grant 101 today. So the very simple things such as that matter. So make sure that if they say you can only have half an inch margins, that's exactly what you have. Um, and if they say your font can be no smaller than size 10 and Arial font, then that's exactly what it is. Also, if they tell you it's only 10 pages, which a typical proposal, a research proposal for NIH is about 10 pages, do not go beyond it. They're, not, they're going to get frustrated and sometimes the administrative people that read through your grant, they're not going to even review it at all. So that's just something to consider for sure. Um, and then the, the other thing beyond that is that when it's only 10 pages, you feel like filling up the entire page. It's important not to do that. I'm going to link a couple of videos from NIH reviewers um, below in the description and you should definitely go watch those if you're interested in NIH. Even if you're not, the feedback they give is really important and really interesting. And one of the things that I learned from those videos is to not cram everything onto those pages. You want to have some white space. Um, and something critical I learned this last year is that you can use bold face font, you can italicize. This is for NIH, it might not be true for other organizations. Um, and that will help direct your reader 
definitely use subheadings throughout to help guide your reader. In addition to those subheadings, NIH is really specific, like I said, for what they want in each section. So if they say in this section, tell me what your specific aims are, you can use the wording, my specific aims are, what bullet point one, two, and three, right? So um, I think that that's something that is really critical is you can plagiarize the actual grant um, request for proposals. So if they say, you know, tell us this and they use that certain phrase, you can use that phrase and then follow it up with your specific grant and what you're doing in your grant. And I think that that is really powerful, something that I didn't really know. I mean, I knew to kind of give them what they wanted, but to actually use the phrase um, helps the reviewers because they are there checking off boxes. So did you did you tell us your specific aims? That's a very basic example, but they're there to make sure you did. Obviously, after that, they're going to look at the content and what your actual project is. And that's kind of where I am today. I feel like they didn't give me any feedback on kind of my grant writing, the art of grant writing. Finally, I feel like I've mastered that. The very first time I submitted two years ago, it didn't get reviewed at all. And this time it got reviewed and I have a moderate impact score. So that's really exciting. It's like I've done two times as good because I could have gotten scored and gotten um, a low impact. And so I'm like two steps above where I was two years ago. So what I wanted to show you here is that there are many elements to a National Institute of Health grant and um, the main two documents that you should work on first are the research strategy and the specific aims. So um, I'm going to show you both of those documents that I submitted. This is the specific aims. What I want to show you this for is um, a few things. First of all, the style and formatting. So um, I talked to you guys about white space. I'm leaving some white space in between paragraphs. I'm also using some bold type and also underlining. Um, there's some italicized words in here to bring attention to these sentences and concepts for the reviewers. These are things that I was proud of. They may or may not have been effective, but that was my goal. Um, and then I have my specific aims and hypotheses underneath. This is a traditional style. Um, at the very end, my mentor, one of them, told me to bold, significant, and innovative because those are things that the um, reviewers are looking for. Okay. So this is the research strategy. Um, because we only have 10 pages, I couldn't have as much white space. Another piece of advice that I was given is to um, use figures and use about one on each page because it's more visually interesting for the reviewers. Um, so I definitely did that and I used color. But when you use color, remember to print your document and make sure that if they print it, it's still can be viewed in black ink because um, the colors were just kind of to make divisions in things and make it interesting, um, but it wasn't necessary in order for reading. Also make sure that you're reviewing, you're referring to your figures um, on the same page that they're on so that it's easy again for reading. And you can see that I'm still using underline and bold and um, I use subheadings that refer to pieces in the grant. Now, this particular mechanism that I went after is called the R15, the area grant for undergraduate institutions. So one of the goals in the RFP was to um, use innovative approaches for engaging undergraduate students in research. So that is one of my subheadings. Um, and then right there, I underline like kind of how we're going to do that. Um, and let's see, um, I did try to have some white space in between the sections, but, um, 
due to space issues. There's not white space everywhere, but I think that the figures really kind of help to break that up a little bit. Also, the figures will help you with space. So using like tables instead of summarizing things in the text. Um, this is all of the preliminary data section of the NIH grants. Um, I saw a reviewer really refer to this section. So one of the, the things that the reviewers had to write down was what we all of the team members were contributing. Um, that's another tip is to know that you cannot do an NIH grant alone and even most grants you cannot do alone. So um, most research projects now are interdisciplinary done by many different people. You may be the primary investigator, but you'll have to utilize other people to help you get it done. And a key component is to have a statistician um, for research grants on your team. So um, I had a professor of math who was willing to be my statistician. Even though you are trained on statistics in your PhD program, it's not good enough. You have to really be a statistician. And then they should be writing your analysis section for you. Um, but just know that everything has to flow. The um, analysis section has to um, really flow with the rest of it. And you, as the primary investigator, principal investigator, are responsible for everything to kind of flow well together. Right. And then all of these sections down here are things that um, that were required, again, by the grant. The last section, um, pro potential problems, alternative strategies, and benchmarks for success. Um, they definitely want you to anticipate things that could go wrong in your grant because it makes them know that you thought about it. And there's always things that are there to be criticized and you are there to tell them how you might address it if it goes wrong. The first thing that I want to show you is that my feedback alone, my grant I said was 10 pages. Now there's a lot of other documents, but the primary documents um, which details everything about the grant is 10 pages and then they ask for other documents as well. The reviewer, there are three of them that read your grant and provide you with feedback. Um, they provided me with 10, is it eight? Eight pages, I believe. Oh, 13. 13 pages of feedback. And um, as you can see, I've gone through it and highlighted things that I think that I need to really focus on. In addition, after getting feedback, I called the program officer. Now, this is true for any grant you um, submit. You can definitely call the program officer, the person that is in charge of those grants. There will be somebody's name and phone number somewhere on the request for proposals or um, on the organization's website. Call and talk to them about your idea, about what you want to submit, and see what they think. That's really, really critical. Um, so that's what I did before I even submitted, and then um, I actually talked to two people about my idea, and then after getting the feedback, after I read through it, I called the program officer and talked to her. Now, when I talked to her, I took a lot of notes, and basically what she got to tell me, she was in the room when the reviewers were discussing my grant, which if it is not scored, that means it was not discussed. They do prioritize early investigators in NIH. They might not in other organizations. Early investigator, I think, means you are within 10 years of getting your PhD. I'm still in that group, so I'm lucky. Um, so that might be why it was reviewed, I don't know. Um, so, so she told me four critical things that maybe the reviewers were really worried about. She read through these 13 pages of reviews and she said you know there's something that they didn't catch that they really didn't reflect in the review but in the room she felt there was a lot of concern over some things um so if you guys want more specifics about my grant let me know and i'll go over it with you but i just want to give you some general things that i think can help you in your process versus giving you like specific information about my grant um, oh gosh, actually there was another half a page of me taking notes 
and um, one thing that she said was for me to sit and have some quiet time um, and really think about how I want to proceed. And I really appreciated that. The program officers are there to help you and they're generally, I've had a really good experience with them being very supportive. Like she said, she is an advocate for us, um, for everyone getting grants. So that's really nice to hear. Also, something that I wanted to share with you is that this is my grants folder on my OneDrive. And I wanted to go through here and show you these because most of these I have not received. And these are all of the grants that I have applied for. Um, so I'm just gonna count down there. I have received, I have received eight of these grants, but um, that a lot of those are internal grants. So the difference between internal and external grants is that internal grants are at a university or they're at your institution that you're at and usually they're small grants. Um, so that's kind of the most that I've received is small grants. And then, like I said, I've received one that is a competitive um, research grant that was from, it was from a foundation. And then I've received a lot of foundation grants in collaboration with community organizations. The difference between the research grants and a foundation kind of, they're usually called community grants, is the research grants, they, they're both, these both of these kinds of grants are focused on impact, but the research grant is focused on the impact of the research on the population that you're looking at. So if you are looking at um, traumatic brain injury, so that's what I research is brain injury. I have to convince the reviewers that my study is going to impact their lives, these people with brain injury. And for National Institute of Health, they're looking at health. How is it going to impact their health, their health access, their health outcomes? Um, and how does the research do that? On the community grant side of things, for foundations that are community grants, they are looking at the impact of an intervention, a program, or a service that you're providing that will impact that population. Those are two very different things, and there are different ways to write these kinds of grants. Um, I was told that a lot of times we are trained as academics to write for manuscripts, and I have published over 40 peer-reviewed manuscripts, um, and I feel like that is what I was trained for, and when you're writing manuscripts, you're writing what you already did. When you're writing a grant, you are a salesman. You're selling them on this impact of your research or impact of your intervention program or service and what that can do for the population that you're serving. That's a very different way of writing, and that's why I say it's like an art and a style. So beyond all of the formatting things that you need, you also are, it's a very different way of kind of being a salesman about your idea. I hope that this was helpful today. If you liked what you saw today, definitely give me a like, let me know. Give me a comment. Um, did you respond well to what I said? Have you heard other tips? We'd love to hear them in the comments. Um, I'm sure this community would love to hear, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.